Uh, in the last uh, few lectures, we have been looking at the importance of uh, materials, especially inorganic and uh, organic materials, uh, which play a very important role in optoelectronic applications, um, especially uh, the lectures on OLEDs have highlighted the use of simple organic molecules and how color tuning can be made and uh, how this can affect the display industry. In today's uh, talk, I will be specially concentrating on solar cells and how materials chemistry has played an important role and uh, the way uh, organic uh, materials have uh, emerged as uh, <coughs> key players in this uh, very coveted technology. Uh, before I go into details, I just want to give you a latest projection from IBM website which says there are 5 innovations that would change our lives in the next 5 years um, and this has just appeared in the IBM website. Uh, they have forecasted that thin film solar cells as flexible panels would drive most of our gadgets in the days to come and uh, the next uh, innovation uh, that would really revolutionize is a genetic mapping which means the moment a person is born, the genetic mapping will tell what sort of diseases or uh, imperfections or any health hazard that a person would face through his lifetime. So, that is going to come in a big way and then you can talk to the web, web can talk to you, digital shopping, portable and stationary smart applications. Why I am highlighting is in all this materials chemistry is involved. And uh, if you would categorize uh, item 3, 4 and 5, these innovations are also in one sense display materials where materials uh, chemistry is used or polymers are used. So, of the 5 innovations that are projected to revolutionize our modern living, uh, 3 to 4 are ma in uh, majority. Uh, seems to deal with the inorganic and organic materials. Therefore, it is very imperative that we study the materials chemistry and understand the photonic and the electronic applications in this uh, <coughs> devices. Um, as I told you, we can broadly classify the photoluminescent materials or photonic materials into optoelectronic materials because materials which interact with photons or electrons, they either produce current or light inversely. So, in the case of uh, uh, in the case of uh, OLEDs, we are actually harvesting light and in the case of solar cells, we are actually harvesting current. So, either way both these devices can be categorized as optoelectronic devices and there is lot of peculiarity between solar cells and the organic LEDs because the device configurations by and large remain the same, but what do we do with the electrons and holes that are generated in these devices is the question and uh, for solar cell we actually would like to harvest the number of uh, electrons and holes that are generated and in organic light emitting diodes we would light, uh, like to generate more of this at a particular interface to harvest light. So, either way they have a close resemblance, but doing two important functions. In both solar cell and organic LEDs, we see there are two categories that are emerging. One is inorganic solar cell mostly to do with silicon devices and organic solar cell which is the new generation ones which are also showing lot of prospects for larger reapplications. In organic LED again we have the small molecule LEDs which are principally uh, molecular based and then you have the polymer based compounds. So, uh, both uh, solar and OLED devices seemingly have a give and take on um, the inorganic and organic components which we can look at it. Uh, just to give you a uh, uh, brief outlook on the solar cells uh, and its history, uh, the actual concept of photovoltaics that is generating uh, current out of uh, photons 
was uh, proposed by Bacquerel in 1839. So, it is very old century old and in 1877 uh, the first solar cell was made by Charles Fritz uh, with the efficiency less than 1 percent. Nevertheless, that was the first demonstration of a solar cell. 1930s a uh, lot of issues concerning solar cell the physics of it was um, expounded by Einstein and Scott Key and the physical principles involved in the solar cells were manifested um, through their uh, experiments and studies. 1941 the first silicon solar cell was made by Russell Owl and in 1986 it was the first organic solar cell a bilayer heterojunction with the uh, efficiency less than 1 percent was reported. Then on we have seen a remarkable change in the solar uh, uh, cell research. In 1980s we have almost reached the maximum therefore, we can see a lot of impact on today's life uh, where more solar, solar panels are now figuring into almost ev every multi story buildings. 1990s silicon and gallium arsenide based solar cells with the efficiency of greater than 20 percent has been found and I would show you shortly that the theoretical capability is up to 26 to 39 percent uh, one can achieve using silicon solar cell and uh, this is a remarkable jump in 1990s and in 1995 bulk heterojunctions with organic solar cell was proposed by you and co-workers and uh, then there has been several combinations um, between MEH PPV and uh, carbon nanotube PPV, uh, PPV blends um, where they act both as donor acceptor molecules. 2001 we found uh, we had another report of a organic solar cell which is actually showing the first uh, efficiency above 3 percent. Since then in the last 10 years many companies have tried to speed up the uh, possibilities of organic solar cells and to bring it into variety of framework including flexible solar cells. So, a lot of panels are being experimented with the large area deposition and uh, with the limited efficiency, but the efficiency as of now is going up to 7 percent as on today with the organic solar cells. Therefore, there is a great market around organic solar cells compared to the most well established silicon solar cells. <coughs> uh, let me just uh, give you a brief outline about what this solar cell is and what are the elements uh, uh, which are contained in the solar cell. So, if you see any panel that is housed uh, on the top of a building you should understand that there are many issues uh, that confronts with that assembly it is not simply mounting uh, a panel. So, here is the view graph which tells what sort of uh, elements it takes to construct a solar panel. One is a primary cell is involved and this cell actually is uh, made into a module with a series of cells and uh, the module is now integrated into a array or a solar panel and this is the solar panel that you see here which is mounted on a rooftop and uh, uh, from the rooftop panel we can actually generate current which is regulated to a uh, power uh, control panel here and uh, from control panel it is, it is actually uh, streamlined to a series of special batteries where the energy is stored. Therefore, this is not an alternating current this is a DC uh, voltage that is generated. So, energy is packed up and this is actually released over a period of time and as a backup you can also have a generator here and this is the inverter that inverts your DC to AC and this can be used for your house apply applications. So, the solar energy is actually um, primarily harvested as a DC current and then it is converted into a AC current using a inverter. So, even in the night whatever that has been harvested through the day can be used in the night or even in hill stations or so where you do not get sunlight much this energy can be stored and can be released at a later time. So, this is uh, in essence a typical solar cell uh, uh, assembly is, but what we will be concerned is 
what really it takes to construct a solar cell here and what are the physics and chemistry issues that are related to it. So, in a solar cell diagram you would see something like this uh, a assembly of a n type and a p type silicon we will come into this issue later uh, where the n type gives out an electron and the p type gives out a, a hole and they together at the interface will form a junction and at the junction you will have the, uh, uh, the charges accumulated both electron and uh, holes and they would actually travel opposite to uh, the um, corresponding electrode electro electrons going towards the anode and the uh, holes going towards the cathode. So, because of this you can actually get generate a current. So, solar cell in essentia, uh, essentially converts solar energy directly to current and this is the assembly and in this assembly you have lot of intricate things which we will be looking at it. For example, you have reflective coating and then you need to have a transparent electrode so that you can knock out electron from the uh, n type silicon. When you look at the uh, types of solar cell there are different types which has emerged among the silicon solar cells um, all these are in reference to silicon you have single crystal solar uh, cell which is actually the most efficient, but also it is very expensive single crystal solar cells and in this single crystalline solar cells you have limitations where you cannot make a panel more than this because in silicon uh, single crystal silicon it is mainly uh, due to vacuum technology and therefore, the vacuum technology uh, the dimension of the cell that you can make or the wafer that you can coat is limited because of the size of the deposition chamber as a result you can maximum go for a 6 inch wafer. This can be a 6 inch wafer with lot of solar cells embedded into it and this is the maximum that can be achieved using a vacuum assembly. As a result if you try to compromise on a single crystal solar cell then you can go for larger panels where you can try to make a polycrystalline uh, solar cell. So, the panel can be much more bigger or we can go for amorphous solar cell all these have unique efficiencies the uh, current output is uh, uh, proportionally large or small, but then uh, maximum efficiency has been found in single crystal solar cell because of the physics involved in it, but still it is one of the most uh, costliest uh, technology therefore, all the other versions have also been experimented. Now, when you look at inorganic solar cells we can either have silicon doped or we can have gallium nitride, we can have gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium nitride or indium gallium arsenide these are some of the other candidates that can replace silicon and still do the job because silicon is in group 4 and uh, you have gallium aluminum indium in group 3 and then arsenic nitrogen phosphorus in uh, in group 5 in group 5 you have nitrogen phosphorus and arsenic therefore you can make a combination of a 3 phi semiconductor. So, these are grouped as 3 phi. So, they can also perform the same action mainly because if you look at the uh, values here the band gap that is generated by this um, 3 phi semiconductors are nearly comparable to that of silicon. So, whatever uh, action that you expect out of silicon you can simulate from the other ones uh, mainly because uh, sil making pure silicon is a very involved technology therefore, the other technologies have emerged over the years. Um, <clears throat> now, what is the advantage and why silicon technology will play a pivotive role is mainly because the sp solar spectrum covers the region 0 0.5 to 3 electron volt and therefore, it really fits into the scheme of things as far as the silicon band gap is concerned. So, it is therefore, a very good candidate which can really take the whole spectrum of um, solar uh, spectrum uh, for converting into current. Now, when you look at silicon doping uh, we would see a animation in the next slide, but then just to 
um, draw your attention to what what would happen if you substitute boron which is in group 3 in a silicon site then you are actually generating a hole because it is one electron deficient or if you substitute phosphorus you are actually generating one extra electron. So, that way you either make a n type or a p type um, <laughs> silicon by doping appropriate amount of boron and phosphorus together and that is what you see in this uh, uh, crystal lattice with a silicon um, which is tetrahedrally coordinated you can bring about an extra electron or you can actually create a hole here because of remove uh, because of boron substitution. So, silicon crystal lattice can be altered the band gap with the suitable dopant atoms and once you create that what happens is you create a internal field because you are making a array of uh, positive holes and you are making array of uh, extra electrons and this can actually if you bring a n type and a p type together you can form a electric field at the p n junction and this can actually uh, drive the uh, electron and the hole pairs to the respective uh, electrodes as a result a current can flow and you can generate uh, flow. So, the inbuilt electri electrical field is what will bring about the uh, production of current. So, how this is done and what are the issues related to it we will see and uh, this is how the p n junction is made. So, you have uh, a p type with the free hole and uh, fixed acceptor impurities and then you have free electrons in the n type and then fixed donor impurity ions are there. So, when you bring this junction you actually create a electric field of this uh, kind where the uh, uh, the electrons will flow to the anode and the uh, holes will uh, f holes will go towards the uh, sorry the uh, electrons will go towards the cathode and the holes towards the anode as a result you can generate the current. And uh, what really happens at that time uh, this could be the homo and the lumo level of your p type um, uh, conductor and this is your uh, uh, lumo and homo for the n type and when you bring this um, together as a uh, device then you can see that the homo and the lumo levels they will adjust themselves uh, because of the electric field and as a result um, you will see that there is a lowering of the band gap because of this p n junction which will bring about the uh, charge, uh, charge generation as a result uh, your current output will also be maximized because you are changing the band gap in the p n junction. Now, what really happens here uh, is the electrons um, in a p n junction uh, in a typical uh, solar panel operates when uh, electron hits um, <coughs> this junction and electrons will be generated towards the cathode and the holes will move towards the anode and uh, the then the electron will uh, do the work and then you it will return back to the um, electrodes it will recombine here and again uh, this flow will be generated continuously. Yeah, we will look at this animation uh, which tells us how this uh, silicon uh, uh, solar cell operates. Usually this silicon is made from sand and therefore, the process of generating pure silicon is a very rich technology and what you see here is silicon that is pure silicon is made out of a refining process and uh, it, to this silicon we dope uh, boron and uh, we can also dope uh, phosphorus as a result we get both the n type and the p type semiconductors and when we bring these two n type silicon and p type silicon then you generate a uh, electric field in the p n junction and the electrons and the holes will start moving towards the respective cathodes. So, when um, sunlight falls essentially at the junction then ele electrons are pumped out and this electrons through a connected wire will go and recombine with the hole that is generated in the p type conductor and that is how the current is generated in a typical solar cell. Um, now, what are the issues that we need to bear in mind when we think of a solar cell 
the physics of it is also important. So, uh, we need to know what's, uh, what sort of uh, IV characteristics is needed. So, the current voltage uh, graph uh, or plot of a typical solar cell will tell whether it is a useful one or not right by looking at the um, shape of the curve. So, there are one is the um, open circuit voltage which is called as VOC open circuit voltage and the second one is short circuit current I suffix SE and fill factor which is a combination of um, open circuit voltage and a short circuit current. So, that will give you a measure whether you are really having a very good device or not and then the power conversion efficiency. So, if you are familiar with these four factors then you can easily evaluate whether uh, you have made a good solar cell or not. So, these are the four uh, important parameters that we need to have in mind. So, in a, a typical solar cell you would see a IV graph like this okay. and uh, this is in a situation when light is not shining or this is called as dark current when light is not illuminating you would typically see a IV curve which is actually in the first quadrant it is actually increasing uh, exponentially in the first quadrant and <laughs> if we apply a forward or a reverse bias then you would have a configuration like this p type silicon connected to a negative terminal in the forward bias n type to a positive and it would be the reverse case when you do a reverse bias. So, in this case you would actually uh, have a, a diode characteristics of this order and um, we would uh, we would also take a look at what this open circuit voltage means and the short circuit current means open circuit voltage is actually defined it is the voltage developed across the electrodes when there is no external circuit. In other words at I is equal to 0 what is the maximum potential that is developed which is called as VOC open circuit voltage and short circuit current is nothing but a current that is at its maximum when voltage is 0. So, when voltage is 0 you get maximum uh, short circuit current when um, when current is 0 you get the maximum open circuit voltage and this is a measure of the maximum power that the solar cell can generate. So, in sh short circuit uh, current the definition it, it is the maximum current from the circuit that occurs when voltage across the device is 0. So, this is the representation of uh, open circuit voltage and the short circuit current that you see a typical view graph of a, a solar cell which is performing under the illumination of light is this. As I told you this is the dark current curve what you see here uh, this is in the absence of light. The moment light is incident on a solar cell you would immediately see that this IV curve is jumping from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant. So, when it goes from the first quadrant to fourth quadrant the values what you see here at the x and y axis becomes critical and this is exactly what you call as ISC that is your short circuit current which is actually uh, <coughs> cutting at the y axis and the curve that is cutting at the x axis is called your open circuit voltage. So, this is important and this is important if this is very less if this is very less then it is going to carry very less current density. Therefore, the current density is a measure of how lower that you can take it. So, when light is incident immediately your solar cell will jump from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant. So, this measure is very important. So, uh, when you uh, have this VOC and IC generated what is important is to draw or to fit a rectangle within this space and the maximum area that you can generate in this rectangle is what you call as fill factor. We will come to this in the uh, next view graph. So, if I can achieve a maximum fill factor that is maximum rectangle area then 
that will be the measure of the performance or efficiency of your solar cell. So, uh, what we will do we can just flip the uh, we can flip this fourth quadrant behavior into the first quadrant and try to take a look at it and see what exactly those values mean. So, uh, this is nothing but the same curve what we have flipped from the uh, fourth quadrant just to have an uh, understanding and this is your ISC and this is your VOC and this point is actually called the VMP and IMP that is the V and I at its maximum. Okay. So, if that is the case then we can actually define what is the fill factor and fill factor is actually given as your IMP VMP over ISC and VOC. So, this fill factor will give you a measure of the performance of your solar cell more the fill factor more the efficiency and therefore, we can also say the area of uh, A that is the shaded region over the area of B will give you the, uh, the measure of your fill factor and accordingly we can also define what is the efficiency of your solar cell by the same formula uh, fill factor into VOC uh, multiplied by um, the short circuit current over the power input will give you exactly what your efficiency is. So, the fill factor um, is the maximum rectangle that can fit under the solar cell IV curve and the IV curve of solar cell lies in the fourth quadrant, but it is flipped just for our understanding. So, the maximum power point is related to the maximum voltage and current by a parameter called fill factor. So, if we have this in mind whenever we measure a solar cell all that you would like to see is the maximum area that you can generate under the curve by. So, visually we can guess whether we have achieved the right efficiency or not. So, the power um, and efficiency is now uh, defined this way. So, power is uh, I cross uh, 4 uh, I cross V. So, at uh, VOC your power is 0 and at ISC your power is 0. So, the maximum power point uh, is PMP which is at the maximum value of I and V. So, that is what is given here and we have already seen that uh, expression in the previous view graph. So, maximum power point is I M P cross V M P this we should bear in mind. Now, there are ways that we can improve this efficiency because when you construct a solar cell there are easy ways to lose it um, because of many factors that are imperatively uh, causing uh, leakage of current within this cell. For example, band gap energy uh, mismatch can also um, lead to loss by transmission. Therefore, um, in silicon solar cells one of the possible ways to avoid that is use a polycrystalline uh, solar cell because um, in single crystalline solar cells you have some problem with the band gap uh, mismatch. Another thing that we can do is uh, <coughs> to use a metallic grid uh, in cases where you have lost due to silicon internal resistance and I will show you in the next cartoon how you can build that solar cell in order to avoid this internal uh, uh, loss due to internal resistance use a metallic grid and uh, silicon itself if you make it as a panel whether a polycrystalline or a single crystalline is very shiny therefore, it will be reflective. So, when solar uh, light is falling sunlight is falling you need to avoid this reflective uh, behavior therefore, you need to use a anti reflective coating and again uh, because it is exposed to air it can accumulate dust it can accumulate any other gases occluding to it therefore, to preserve the cell from this sort of contaminant you need to have a glass cover plate. So, that the uh, the, the uh, amount of uh, solar energy that is absorbed is always maintained. So, for this reason a uh, lot of external things also has to be done. So, typically this is how you overcome for uh, avoiding the silicon internal resistance you use a metallic grid and then you can actually put a anti reflection coating 
and uh, we can house it in a, a place which is actually free and uh, again it is also mounted in a slant way you never see a flat one because you do not want any dust and other uh, stuff to deposit therefore you always keep it on a slant position. So, the mountable issues are also uh, to be taken into consideration to improve the efficiency of the solar cell. Um, there are few uh, things that I want to comment about the silicon solar cell one is crystalline and polysilicon technologies are the leading technologies in producing photovoltaic cells as of now because 90 percent of the solar cell modules what you see in uh, in our household applications or even in uh, uh, energy sectors uh, these are those are all proven by silicon therefore people would not like to invest on anything other than a silicon solar cell as of now because it's well established but the uh, amount of uh, power that you generate per dollar uh, or per uh, for for, uh, for the rupee that we give uh, it is it has to be lowered in order to go for um, variety of applications therefore uh, silicon has to be replaced and that is the reason why organic uh, solar cells are coming into uh, picture during its long years of development silicon has proved to be a highly reliable material the highest theoretical density is that you can achieve for uh, a concentration mode that is 36 percent but as of now what is available is only up to 20 23 percent therefore there is a long way to go to improve but this technology has its own limitation therefore uh, there is still lot of other um, combinations which are being worked out in the silicon solar cell high efficiency silicon solar cells of more than 19 percent efficiency have been developed with the uh, intricate device structure and uh, for this you actually require highly pure material. So, because of this constraints um, and also uh, because of uh, not able to make larger panels organic solar cells have been tried because in organic solar cells you can actually go for flexible substrates you can roll it roll to roll you can make therefore, processing feasibility is there number one number two organics can be prepared with much more ease compared to making pure silicon. As a result organic solar cells are taking lot of attention, but again uh, the problem is some of the organic solar uh, organic molecules can degrade with exposure to sunlight over a period of time. Therefore, you need to bring about the right combination of organic uh, molecules which can actually withstand a harsh chemical uh, environment. So, uh, there are several possibilities are there but from the lab uh, lab based solar cells or uh, lab fabricated solar cells there are several issues that we can understand about the um, mechanism about the chemistry that is rich in this organic solar cells. So, I would go through few details to show you what it is. Uh, there is a very good uh, article in materials today by uh, Alex Mayer's group from Stanford where they have made a very good uh, review article on polymer based solar cells and they have also comprehensively covered all the solar cells which are in the market both developed from the industries and from uh, leading universities. Um, just would like to bring out few points what they have mentioned in their abstract. Uh, it has been shown that the inorganic components can be replaced by semiconducting polymers capable of achieving high power conversion efficiency. So, this is one of the attractive term to convert from silicon to uh, polymer solar cells, but inherently the polymer properties are limited because of low exciton diffusion lengths, low mobilities and therefore, uh, nano scale morphologies have been tried now. So, uh, even among polymer solar cells you now have nano uh, sized base semiconductors uh, coming as a interplay with these polymers. So, uh, these are called as heterojunctions where inorganic uh, components mixed with polymers are coming out to be a very good compromise for this polymer based solar cells. I will show you few examples of that. Now, in organic solar cell uh, it is not the band gap that would determine 
uh, which is nothing but your p type and n type band gap which will determine the performance of your uh, solar cell here in this case you are talking about the homo and lumo gap. So, if you are going to promote a electron from a homo level of, um, of your donor uh, to the lumo level and the electron will actually be transferred to the acceptor level uh, acceptor lumo level and that will uh, be generated as the current. But what happens here when we try to uh, generate this uh, <coughs> electron a hole is formed in the uh, homo level and this binding energy of this electron hole pair is very high of the order of 1.4 electron volt compared to the binding energy of the excitons in the silicon solar cells. As a result the diffusion lengths are going to be very less. So, there are problems encountered in generating maximum efficiency in this organic solar cell. Now, this is how it happens uh, what you see is a glass substrate which is on the top and uh, sunlight falls on uh, the glass substrate and then goes through anode anode ejects out um, the positive hole and then it is uh, <coughs> it is going to come to a interface here where there is a donor acceptor uh, interface and then the um, electron is actually accepted by the acceptor solar cell that we are seeing because the combinations that you can work out between a donor and the acceptor is actually to do with the homo lumo levels and not with the band gaps. So, you need to have a proper understanding of what a homo lumo uh, level gap is and for this we can actually have a uh, few uh, types of organic uh, solar cells. One is a silly, uh, single layer solar cell where you have a uh, glass substrate then indium tin oxide which is your anode and aluminum as your cathode just a single organic film or we can actually go for a donor which will donate electron and the acceptor which will take uh, electron and this sort of double layer so organic solar cell can be generated or we can have a bulk heterojunction where you can have both a blend of acceptor and donor mixed together mainly making a single layer and thereby you can make a bulk heterojunctions. So, in this uh, organic solar cell uh, we do not have the concept of uh, n type and p type we rather talk about a donor and a acceptor uh, layers and uh, the main issue there is they should have a smaller optical band gap for this reason most of the most of the molecules that we have should be conducting and also they should be having a extended conjugated pi bonds and the extensively conjugated pi structures can actually play a very important role both as a acceptor or a donor and uh, with a reduced optical band gap and I will show you some examples of the structures that are already used. For example, in the case of um, donors, so we have most uh, frequently used donors are those which are uh, having a fluorine moiety and uh, the triphenyl amine moiety. So, these are uh, very much repeated as donor molecules they have a very uh, low band gap and easily they can um, give out electrons. Also we have uh, um, porphyrin unit which can be used or P 3 H T which is nothing but um, your uh, hex hexyl thiophene which is substituted in the third position this is a uh, of a polymeric form. So, it is po popularly called P 3 H T this can also play a very useful role as uh, a donor molecule and also we have polyphenylin uh, vinylin this is your vinylin moiety this is your uh, phenylin moiety. So, if you are uh, actually substituting this to a uh, octyl group then you get this uh, <coughs> MDMO PPV and this PPV is nothing but phenylin vinylin uh, unit and this is also one of the most uh, um, frequently used polymer as, as a donor. Uh, there are a lot of integrated uh, compositions or sub, uh, with new substitutions have emerged, but by and large 
the fluorines are uh, widely used. One of the reason why fluorines are used over other ones is because of the high molecular weight. Be, uh, with, with high molecular weight it is very easy for you to make a larger um, uh, panel and it is easy to roll and you can make a good uh, connectivity uh, in the thin film. Therefore, high molecular weight polymers are generally recommended therefore, fluorines do play a very important role. Similarly, we can have um, some acceptor polymers um, also with substitution uh, here um, you can have uh, this sort of benz uh, diazole uh, substitutions in fluorine which can make this more as a acceptor, but predominantly used acceptors are PCBM which is nothing but a esterified uh, unit of C 61 and the C 61 is uh, uh, with this uh, ester uh, linkage is one which is uh, very popularly used as a blend with uh, the donor molecules. And again we have this uh, fullerene perylene triads are also being tried out uh, mainly for stability and also for uh, extended conjugation. Therefore, this is also one of the um, good candidates for acceptor polymers. Now, as I told you um, what is more important is the match between the donor <coughs> uh, homo lumo levels and the acceptor homo lumo levels and uh, the, the homo level of your donor actually has to be higher than the homo level of your acceptor and also the lumo level of your donor has to be higher than the lumo level of your uh, acceptor. Therefore, electron when it is actually promoted here when it is promoted it can easily go across the interface to the acceptor and the electron can flow easily and uh, further the hole can flow in the opposite direction. So, the combination of your donor and acceptor depends on the homo lumo levels of your donor and acceptor molecule. So, if your homo level of your acceptor is going to be here then the promotion of the holes will not be synchronized. Similarly, if the lumo level is going to be here then there will be a barrier for this electron to be injected to the acceptor level. Therefore, this match has to be taken into care. There are also several other combinations of donor acceptor molecules that are verified porphyrin is uh, known ferrocin and uh, C 60 is also a very good combination perylin bisimide is a well known um, acceptor now which is being evaluated. So, these are other donors and acceptors which are also be emerging as good candidates. Now, uh, when we look at this uh, polymer solar cell there are few things that we should make sure while we make the right match. So, that the desirable and undesirable um, combinations or process are taken care. When you eject an electron we expect the electron from the uh, polymer surface to actually go into the electron acceptor either a polymer or which is doped with C 60 and uh, T A O 2. This electron should actually be channelized properly to go straight into the electrode. This is what is the desired process, but what can happen is the undesirable ring combination effects where electron can actually get bound to the hole as a exciton and it is not free to move. Therefore, your diffusion length has to be pretty large for the traffic to be modulated in this direction or what can happen is the electron can go to the electron acceptor level, but then again can be recombining in this fashion which is not a desirable case. So, when we look at the organic electronic uh, electronics uh, it is uh, a emerging field it was not thought to be a candidate at all uh, at least few years back. So, uh, what is uh, really the motivation was the conductivity in polyacetylene uh, which actually created uh, more interest for um, exploring newer uh, polymers or organic uh, molecules uh, which can play the role of uh, donors and uh, acceptors. Now, 
because of this problem of uh, exciton hole getting bound and they are not able to get dissociated into um, electron and hole separately then heterojunctions uh, solar cells have emerged into picture as I told you this is your homo level and uh, this is your lumo when electrons are ejected then you have the electron here and the hole here and these pairs are actually bound and the excitonic binding energy is of the order of 0.1 to 1.4 electron volt that is what is measured in the organics. Whereas, uh, if you take the silicon solar cells the electron hole binding pair is of the order of milli electron volt because they have a very less binding energy they can easily dissociate into electron and hole and the current can be generated easily. But in this case there is a problem of um, this overcoming the exciton diffusion length as a result uh, instead of having the um, <coughs> donor and your acceptor uh, at a larger uh, length scale we can try to bring this as a heterojunction where you can reduce the length so as to overcome this binding energy and that is what we can achieve. Uh, the concept of bulk heterojunction using low band gap polymers and nanoparticles like C60, C70 and its functional deriv derivatives like PCBM this has led to about 7.9 efficiency and these are the candidates I have already discussed with you about the use of PCBM and uh, these are some of the donor molecules. So, uh, this is the typical configuration of your uh, uh, donor acceptor uh, configuration in a organic solar cell and uh, these are your uh, bilayer solar cells and this is actually not giving enough efficiency. So, the heterojunctions are construed like this where you make a physical mixture of the both this in this fashion or we can try to pattern this in this form where you have a uh, the donor and the acceptor in a smaller length scale and it is alternatively placed so that the exciton binding energy diffusion length can be overcome with this nanostructures. That is the reason why this patterning is made instead of making a double layer and by this way the efficiency of your solar cell has been um, achieved to a greater extent and uh, this is a view graph uh, which tells uh, that there is a equal competition between the leading universities and also uh, the <coughs> uh, companies where they are trying to experiment on polymer solar cells as you can see here uh, Konarka, Siemens these are all leading players uh, companies who are working in bringing this to market and equally there are less, several universities Berkeley, um, Cambridge uh, then you have uh, Santa Barbara um, and UCLA all these universities have actually brought uh, several nanostructures which are having efficiency up to 6 percent. So, uh, there, there are more prospects to harvesting higher efficiencies in this organic solar cells. Um, in IIT Kanpur also we have a group which is actively working this is uh, Dr. Anand's group and typically you, you can see the organic solar cell uh, requires a, a synthesizing platform like this where you do absolutely in an inert condition you do not expose it. So, you can actually get uh, very clean uh, heterojunctions made within uh, one chamber all conducted inside vacuum and many solar panels have been made in this uh, lab in this institute where simple gadgets like calculators or timers anything can be operated using uh, the solar cells and these are um, demonstrations from uh, our own uh, groups at IIT Kanpur. And uh, you can see uh, the threshold voltage uh, for these solar panels are uh, less than one, elect oh, 1 volt therefore, the device performance are good and you are able to get very good uh, current density and uh, 21 devices in a series can be arranged to demonstrate how this can be made. I will touch uh, briefly on dye sensitized solar cells before I close. Uh, the developments of inorganic nanoparticles like silicon, uh, zinc oxide, TaO2 mixed with polymer can actually 
help us make ink formulation so that we can make very big panels at the same time we can overcome the issue of exciton binding energy by using a uh, dye uh, sensitized uh, for, uh, solar cells and this is possible because these uh, semiconductors can do the job that is required in a organic uh, uh, photovoltaics and this is a demonstration of how such a dye sensitized platform can work. And as you see here this is a, uh, a typical device uh, out of a dye sensitized uh, solar cell and if you look at a block this is how the device configuration is where you have um, the glass protective electrodes and then conductive electrodes titanium dioxide and uh, <coughs> a catalyst which is actually uh, forming the middle layers the electrons and uh, can come and go from both the extremes where the middle layer is actually packed with um, titanium particles and on the surface of the titanium particles you can see this red spheres which are the dyes and when light falls the red dyes actually bring out electron and it is pumped into the titanium conduction band and this electron is now transferred to the conductive layer which actually does the work and then this electron flows to the lower conducting layer and from this lower conducting layer it is actually transferred to another layer through a catalyst where it comes in contact with a electrolyte which is a triiodide and once this electron goes this uh, goes here this triiodide is converted into a iodide ion and then this iodide ion actually moves to the upper layer and comes in contact with your TiO2 doped with dye and transfers the electrons back to the dye and then it returns back as triiodide. Now this deactivated uh, <coughs> dyes can actually do the performance again as a result this can happen uh, 100,000 times in a second and thereby generating a continuous stream of electron. So, this is one way the organic solar cell efficiency can be improved by incorporating nanoparticles of semiconductors like TiO2 and so on. Uh, lastly, I would like to just conclude with some of the prospects of this solar cells because of the ability to make large area displays we can actually use it in different environment remote light sensing telecommunication. Uh, solar powered water uh, supply emergency power systems and so on. Not only that the application of solar cell is now transcending more than that e even to satellites and space vehicles. So, the, uh, the use of solar cell cannot be limited and as you would see here within a uh, few years the amount of materials that can be used from the chemistry point of view has accelerated to a larger extent. There is a great combination between organic and inorganic um, uh, materials and uh, nano materials are also now pitching in to uh, prove uh, the efficiency of the solar cell to a greater uh, extent and therefore, there is lot more excitement that is possible. So, when you think of uh, solar cell applications in perspective, we need to think about the band gap we need to think about the donor and acceptor abilities, we need to think of the efficiency that it can bring about and the four parameters that I told you the fill factor, the efficiency, the short circuit current and the uh, over, uh, open circuit voltage all these are critical parameters when we try to think of uh, solar cells. And I will also list some of the links and uh, some more references where you can get more comprehensive idea about the materials that we can use and how chemistry can play a very vital role in designing this solar cells.